what's up everybody and welcome to What's Up with Dr. A. Nathan Young. Thank you so much for tuning in. I'm so glad that all over the place you're telling me how this ministry is blessing you and how you're tuning in and how you can't wait to see it on Sunday mornings. We thank God that this ministry is blessing so many people all over this region and we thank God for the fruit that it's going to produce in your life. We're going to go into our 11 a.m. service at our Covington campus right now. Meet us right back here in 26 minutes. I can't wait to see you. I'm super excited today because we're starting a new series called Overcomer. A lot of principles that I'm going to be teaching you through this series uh, are principles that I've applied and that have worked in my own life. And I'm super, super excited about it uh, because I know that they work. Uh, and today we're going to start the series off talking about overcoming destructive thoughts. The Bible says in Proverbs 23, 7, for as he thinks in his heart, so is he. So you don't get anything else. The one thing that I want you to get is that your life is a reflection of the way you think. If you think you can, you probably will. If you think you can't, you probably won't. If you wake up every day and you say, my life is all negative and everything is negative, then chances are your day is going to be, a, come on, a negative day. You wake up and you say, today is not going to be good. Then guess what? Today is probably not going to be what? But if you wake up and say, you know what? I'm going to have a good what? day, then you're probably going to have a good word. Day. Listen to me. Your life will always move in the direction of your strongest thoughts. I am not saying that positive thinking cures all problems. It's not what I'm saying. But what I am saying is that outside of your relationship with Jesus Christ, the way you think is more important than anything in your life. It's more important than the circumstance. How I think about my problem is more important than the problem itself. How I think about my circumstance is more important than the circumstance itself. Why? Because depending on the way I think, I can either make my circumstance better or I can make it worse. I can either make my problem better or I can make it worse. And you listen to me, everybody look up here. Your marriage, your finances, your career, your walk with the Lord, all of those things for the most part, 9.9 .9 times out of 10, they are a reflection of the way that you think. If you have a messed up marriage, 9.9 .9 times out of 10, the reason why is because you think messed up about your marriage. No, pastor, it ain't me, it's them. That's why I said 9.9, .9. there is that point one, amen? <laughs> but most of the time, even when they acting crazy, if you thinking right, God will use what you doing in your marriage to win them back to where they ought to be. You got to make sure that you're thinking right. You, you, you got to make sure that your mind is right. You, you got to make sure that you think right about your life. You got to make sure that you think right about your problems. The reason why I keep coming back to this is because it's so important. And, and because I know that I'm looking at people who wake up every day and you wrestle with the wrong thoughts. And you're struggling right now. You're in a rut right now. Not, not because of anything except the wrong thoughts. It, Pastor, I'm in a financial rut. I'll never forget, I got in a financial rut. I was talking to my dad about it, and I went to him, and I told him, I said, I'm in this rut. And his question for me was, well, what you going to do? Now, when he said to me, what you going to do, that was a layered statement. Anybody ever hit you with a layered statement? When he asked me, what you going to do, he wasn't really asking me a question. He was really telling me, I'm not what you're going to do. <laughs> Anybody ever hit you with one of them? 
<laughs> he was telling me I'm not the answer. I said, well, I was thinking that I would borrow some money in order to get myself out of this situation. You know what he told me? He said, son, and it's never left me. He said, borrowing money is never the answer to a money problem. He said, you never solve a money problem by borrowing money. Borrowing money only creates more money problems. Now watch this. If I had gone with the way I thought, then I would have created even more of a problem than I already would have. It's all in the way you were. Look, listen to me. It's the way you think. And if you want to change your life, you got to change the way you think about your life. And through this series, I want to teach you how to change the way you think. Why? Because if, if we change the way we think, if we get to thinking in the right direction, I'm telling you, our lives will move in the right direction. I'm not telling you something I think. I'm telling you something I know. This morning I got up, and I still struggle with this. I got up, and man, like, I could, y'all notice I don't have my iPad with me? I normally preach with my iPad, but this morning I got up, and y'all, I could not find my iPad, and oh my God, this was a crisis of epic proportions, because I never preach without my what? I, I always have my iPad, and so I can't find my iPad. You know, it's, it's 4.35 o'clock in the morning. Joy's trying to sleep. I'm turning on lights. I'm turning up pillow covers. I'm looking under the bed. I'm looking in my office. I'm, you know, I'm looking everywhere. I'm tearing stuff up, and I cannot find my what? Now, I want you to get this. Over and over and over, I kept thinking, I got to find it because I can't preach if I don't have my what? My iPad, so I'm going crazy. Finally, it got down to the wire. I said, I got to get dressed. I was late for the walkthrough this morning. Supposed to be here for 7. I got here, 7.05. Why? Because I'm looking for my iPad. I'm all in the car looking for the iPad. I'm so focused on this iPad, I get out the car, and Brother Isaac, he's always there at the door when I get here on Sunday mornings. He opens the door, big, huge smile. Good morning, Dr. Young. I got out this morning. He said, good morning, Dr. Young. And I said, I can't find my iPad. <laughs> he said, again, good morning, Dr. Young. I said, good morning. I can't find my iPad. <laughs> I walk in. I walk into the walkthrough. I come in the walkthrough. They're already in the middle of the walkthrough. I walk straight up to KG, my executive assistant, and she said, good morning, Pastor. I said, I can't find my iPad. And she looked at me and she said, what you want me to do? I said, help me find my iPad. She said, well, Pastor, I don't know where it's at. She moves on with the walkthrough, and I'm sitting here thinking, some kind of assistant you are. You ain't assisting me right now. I'm consumed with finding this doggone iPad. I walk out of the walkthrough, go back into the conference room. John comes back there. Good morning, Pastor. Dude, we in trouble. I can't find my iPad. This is an emergency. We got 20 minutes till the service start. I got to preach and I can't find my iPad. Call 911, code 10, get them chains off them doors. I... Oh, y'all don't remember that? Come on, seven is babies. Lean on me. Fair east side. For the sun will shine. Come on. It's a, I can't find, I'm going crazy. Watch this. My morning was all jacked up. Why? Because in my mind, I can't do what I got to do today without my what? Hey. What in your life have you been convinced that you can't do without? And as a result, your days are all jacked up. I want to suggest something to you. 
It's not that you can't do without it. It's just that you've allowed yourself to be convinced that you can't do without it. Watch what the Bible says, 2 Corinthians 10.3. It says, for though we live in the world, we do not wage, what's that next word? Listen, everybody look up here. You got to hear me on this. There is a war going on. And it's a battle for control of your mind. Your mind is a battlefield between God's truth and the enemy's lies. Satan is called the father of lies. And his role in your life is every day, at every moment, at every chance he gets to convince you of the lies that he tells. And every day about every situation, he tries to convince you about lies. Watch this. And then there's God's truth that those lies are going against. And in your mind, there's this constant battle between Satan's lies and God's truth. There's a war going on. Watch this. And the reason why we lose in life a lot of times is because we got a war going on that we ain't even fighting. We losing every day. It's a war. And we show up every day to a war without any weapons. We just allow Satan to have a field day in our minds. He says we do not wage war as the world does. The weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world. In other words, we have weapons at our disposal. What kind of weapons, Pastor? On the contrary, These are weapons that have divine what? Listen to me, everybody. You have the same power inside of you that got Jesus up from the dead. If you're a Christian, the same power that resurrected Christ from the dead, you live with it every single day. And so this war that's going on for the battlefield of your mind is not a war that you have to lose because God's given you every weapon that you need to win it. You have the power of Christ living inside of you and so there is nothing that's impossible for you. Watch this. Watch what he says. Divine power to do what? Demolish what? Listen. First of all, that word strongholds comes from a Greek word, ochurama. And what it means is it's a prisoner locked in by deception. So watch this. Watch what happens. Satan tells us a lie. We believe the lie. And he tells it to us enough, and we believe it enough so that we get locked into it. This morning, I got locked into the lie that said you can't teach without your iPad. I walk out of here, go into my conference room, John comes in. If you know John Singleton, our sound booth guy, he's just a straight kind of guy, like no sugar coating, no nothing. Just this what it is. Oops, I ain't mean to say that, but yes, I did kind of guy. He walks in my office and I say, I don't have my iPad. You know what's the next thing he said? He said, you don't need it. I said, what you mean? He said, pastor. He said, you ain't preached with your iPad in seven months. He said, you just bring it up there and put it on the table and forget about it. And then pick it up when you leave. He said, you don't preach with it anyway, so you don't need it. I sat there for a second. I said, you're right. I don't never use my iPad. I just bring it up there. And then he said this. He said, you know what your iPad is for you? I said, what? He said, a security blanket. He said, so basically what you're saying is, I need my blanket. (laughs) I'm sorry you don't have your blanket, Pastor. I said, boy, if I wasn't looking so sharp, I'd beat you everywhere but the bottom of your feet. (laughs) But he was right. I never use it anyway. But I got so wrapped up 
in the lie that Satan was telling me this morning that I believe that I can't teach without my iPad when the truth is I do it every single Sunday. So why would he tell me that? Because he knows that somebody's going to show up here who needs life change. Somebody's going to show up here who needs a word from the Lord. And if he can implant in my mind that I can't do it without my iPad, I come on this stage feeling like I ain't got a word. And when John told me that, I said, Satan, you're a liar. I got the Holy Spirit. And he's my iPad. And he'll bring back to my mind whatever he wants to say to his people. Hey, what, what's your security blanket? <laughs> what has Satan convinced you that you just can't live without? That God's been telling you to let go? What's your security blanket? Buying lies. Well, Pastor, what do we do with this? First thing I want you to do with it is identify your enemy. Look, you can't fight an enemy you don't know. Because you don't know how to fight them. You, you got to identify your enemy. In other words, I, we know it's coming from Satan. But what's your stronghold? What's that thought that every time you go to do something that's going to progress your life? That thought that comes to mind that stops you from doing it. Oh, you're going to serve in the ministry? No, you don't need to serve in no ministry. You don't even know your spiritual gift. You serve in the ministry, then people at that church are going to really get to know you. And you know you don't want that to happen. <laughs> oh, you going to get in the life group? Don't get in the life group. You ain't got time. Plus, there ain't a bunch of nothing but a bunch of people sitting around talking about the Bible. You don't understand the Bible, and you got to know something about the Bible. You're going to look like a fool when you show up to that group. Don't go to that group. What's your stronghold? Oh, you're going back to school? You ain't got time to go back to school. You don't have time. You're too old. It's, it's, man, give, give it up. Forget about it already. Oh, you're going to make that career move? Don't make that career move. You're unqualified. Ain't no way in the world you tried it before and you failed, didn't you? Why are you even going to try it? What's your stronghold? Oh, you good at your career, but you're a horrible parent. What, what's the lie that you keep buying? I, I want you to identify it. And then here's what I want you to do. I want you to choose your weapon. He says, the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they are mighty in what? God, what weapons do we have at our disposal? Listen to me. When you look in Ephesians, Ephesians 6, when God, through the Apostle Paul, is laying out the armor of God, everything he names is a weapon of defense. In other words, a way to protect yourself. Except the sword. The sword is the only weapon of offense. What is the sword of the spirit? That's the word of God. It's an offense. And notice he says in another place in the word that the Bible is a two-edged word. In other words, it cuts wherever it's swung. And so when I say choose your weapon, what I'm saying is choose your sword. Like for me. I'll be an open book with you. I never accomplished much before I started preaching. I tried a lot of things, but I, I was never an accomplished guy. I, when I was in high school, I tried sports. But I was too small to play football, too short to play basketball, not strong enough to hit the baseball, couldn't see good enough to catch it, too slow to run track. I tried all of them, but was just never any good. And I have a dad who's just like old school. Me and him are best friends now. We, but he's old school, and he would just tell me straight up, like, you need to stick to the books, bro. 
<laughs> I know now, like as parents, like we positive, right? You can do, we lie to our kids. You can do anything you put your mind to. Go ahead and try it. Or you want to make it to the NFL, shoot for the stars. My daddy was the type who was like, don't shoot for the stars, son, because the clouds about as far as you're going to get. <laughs> I go in the military after high school, get in the military, and I hope this don't come back to bite me. I'm just, I'm just be honest with y'all. I, I signed up for four years, didn't make it four years. At about two years, you know, I cut up so bad. I had my commanding officer, she liked me. And she came to me, and this is what she told me. She said, Am I young? Time for you to part ways with the Air Force. <laughs> she said, Because if you don't part ways with the Air Force, you're going to get in some more trouble, and I'm going to kick you out of the Air Force. And then your DD 214 is going to say dishonorable discharge, and that's going to haunt you for the rest of your life. I said, yes, ma'am. <laughs> I get home, I try to start a business. That didn't go right. I get in school, I fell out of school. I move in with my daughter's mom. We trying to, you know, do, read Kindle the Flame or whatever it was. I pull up to the house one day, they got a U-Haul in front of the house. I say, where you going? She said, away from you. I said, I don't know where that is, but it's clear. <laughs> I failed at everything, so watch this. Over time, what got planted in my head was, you ain't about nothing. You'll never accomplish anything big. You'll never achieve anything major. And the whole time I knew it was because I was running from my real purpose, my real calling, but still in my head, what got planted was you'll never succeed at anything because everything you touch falls apart. That's the way it has been, that's the way it is, and that's the way it always going to be. Well, here we are, years later, I went back to college, I got a degree in accounting, did very well at it. Graduated from undergrad when I got my master's of divinity from New Orleans Baptist Theological Seminary. Did very well at it. Went on to get my doctorate from New Orleans Baptist Theological Seminary. Did very well at it. I've done some major things, but can I tell you, all along the way, there was the enemy. You can't do this. It ain't going to happen. Ain't no way you could get your master's. You're not smart enough. Ain't no way you could get your doctor. Then when I did all the courses for my doctorate, oh no, because now you got to write a book. You can't half read. How you going to write a book? Just over and over telling me why I can't do it. But I learned something along the way, and that's the principle that I'm trying to teach you. I learned that the weapons of warfare that I have are mighty in God. And what I learned to do is choose my weapon. So when Satan tells me you can't do this, I learned to do what Christ did and tell the word back to him and say, devil, you're a liar. I can do all things through Jesus Christ who gives me strength. When he tells me I ought to be afraid to try, I say, God hasn't given me a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. I fight those thoughts with the word. He said, the power to what? Demolish. demolish. He said, I want you to demolish strongholds. You know why many of us get strongholds set up in our life and why many of us get stuck in ruts and why many of us believe the lie of Satan and he's able to convince us of it? It's because we don't demolish it. We entertain it. We let it linger. We let it hang out. You got to demolish the lies that the enemy tells you. And the reason why you keep buying it is because you keep pity patting around with it. No, what he's saying is when Satan plants that lie in your head, you're a liar. 
get behind me. The word of God says I'm the head and not the tail. I rebuke you in the name of Jesus. Go back to the hell where you came from. We play around with it. We entertain it. Richard Pryor say when he was in jail, he said the way he kept his enemies off of him was he told jokes. He said, that's how I kept them off of me. He said, they had a hundred games, and I was in all of them. <laughs> that's one way to do it. He said, I knew I couldn't fight, and I had to either had to fight or make them laugh. He said, so I decided to make them laugh. Watch this. Why you keep losing to your enemy? Because instead of fighting, you entertain it. You're giving it a place in your heart. And before you know it, you're locked into the deception of the enemy. Just like I was about my iPad. Now I says, well, what we do, Pastor? You choose your weapon. And then, after you choose your weapon, you fight like your life depends on it. Because it does. Not only does your life depend on it, but your eternity does as well. I want you to get this. How does my eternity depend on it? I'm saved already. Because one day you're going to stand before God. And God's going to ask you, what did you do? With the opportunities, with the gifts, with all of the things that I deposited in you. The sad truth for some of us is we're going to say, well, I bought the lie of Satan. He told me I couldn't. And so I lived my whole entire life. Like it was impossible. Dr. Miles Monroe, God rest his soul, said the graveyard is one of the richest places in the world. He said there's no place in the world that's as wealthy as the graveyard. Why? He said because in the graveyard, there are books that were never written. Businesses that were never opened. There are dreams that were never fulfilled. In, in the graveyard, there are men who were supposed to be pastors who died from addiction. There are ladies who were supposed to be missionaries who died as prostitutes. He said there's no place richer than the graveyard. And then he said this. He said, don't take what God gave you to give to the world to the cemetery. Don't make the cemetery any richer than it already is. Die empty. Die and say, I left it all behind. I did everything I could with what God gave me. I refuse to believe the lie of Satan when he told me I couldn't. I stepped out on faith, believing God for who he was, and I chased his purpose for my life. 